Hey folks, this episode of WTF is sponsored by Squarespace, the all-in-one platform that makes it fast and easy to create your own professional website or online portfolio. For a free trial and 10% off, go to squarespace.com, use offer code CATS, C-A-T-S, CATS. Uh, and also, I'm not sure if you've had the chance to catch Comedy Central's new show, Broad City, but you should do yourself a favor and watch it. The easiest way is probably on demand or on Comedy Central's website. The show has had great reviews on the Onion AV Club, Grantland, and a bunch of other sites. It stars two great female comics, Abby Jacobson and Alana Glazer. It has had appearances by Hannibal Burris, Fred Armisen, and is produced by Amy Poehler. It is a great show, and as always, good to see Comedy Central taking a chance on some young talent. All right, let's do an episode of WTF. You wanna? Okay, here we go. <laughs> All right, let's do this. How are you? What the fuckers? What the fuck buddies? What the fuckeristas? What the fuck nicks? What the fucksters? I am Mark Marin. This is WTF. We are doing it. Today's a, a, a big day because uh, I got Ron White. On the show, Ron White from the Blue Collar Comedy Tour. Uh, some of you may know him. He, he is the uh, he's the dark, honest one on uh, in that batch. A great comic and a guy I've been trying to get on the show for a long time. He's, I think, a lot of uh, my ilk or the alt ilk or the ilk of people that don't necessarily pay much attention to comedy may pi- may pigeonhole that crew. As uh, something that they just across the board don't like, but I'm here to tell you that Ron White's a great fucking comic, and I'm thrilled to have him on the show. It was a good talk. He's a hard liver, and uh, he's been through some stuff, but he, he is uh, one of the great long-form comedians that, that is working out there and, and has been for years. I was thrilled to have him on the show. We'll get to that in a second. I'm going to be doing a series of dates at the Trippany House here in L.A. at the Steve Allen Theater. I will be doing uh, February 18th, these are Tuesdays, uh, March 11th, and March uh, 4th. So Feb 18, March 4, and March 11th at the Trippany House. Uh, These are are small shows. These are just uh, for me to ramble and flounder and wrestle with myself. They're eight bucks. Uh, All the proceeds will go to benefit the theater. I just... uh, I need a I need a, a supportive ear, folks. So if you want to see me do that, I mean, certainly some of you uh, witness it here every uh, uh, twice a week, but to see it in person, and you know, I'm not going to make any guarantees. These are workshop shows, and I'm I'm looking for I'm looking for trains of thought. I want to try and jump on some trains of thought and figure out what it is I need to be talking about. And if you want to be part of that process, I might even need you. I might need to talk to you. So that's the Trippany House. You can go to trippany.org. February 18th, March 4th, and March 11th, I will be doing these uh, Marin Flounders evenings. So Valentine's Day is tomorrow. Now, you know, I, I want to tell you the story. I want to tell you the long-form story of the relationship I, I am in now. Uh, I, I told you that I was seeing Moon, but I don't know if you really know just, you know, the evolution of that thing. I think is romantic. I don't know. You know, I'm a 50-year-old man. I've had a lot of life experiences. I've been in a lot of weird places. I've had my heart broken a couple of times. I've broken some hearts, uh, you, you know, and, but I seem to still get up and, and keep trying uh, to find love and to, to be in love and, and to deal with it and to accept it and to, and to try to, to nurture it or make it work. And it's not easy for me. It doesn't, uh, it's, uh, I'm not a natural for whatever reason. Uh, it, it hasn't worked out for me, uh, in, in the long term. But I, I no longer look at my past marriages or my past relationships as, I, I don't, I don't regret them. I have to see them as some sort of growth and, and they're all very painful. But I mean, what are the choices? I mean, do you just, you know, get your heart broke and then close, close it up, nail it down, close the door and just sort of, slowly smolder through life with a certain amount of bitterness and fear about, you know, just being in relationship at all? Do you you just, you know, spend your life having angry sex with strangers and hookers and yourself for the rest of your life? Is love worth it? Well, I'll tell you what, tomorrow it is, 
because tomorrow is Valentine's Day, and that's why I want to give you one final shot to make things right with Pro Flowers. For today and tomorrow, we've got the One Dozen Red Roses special. One Dozen Red Roses, a free glass vase, a teddy bear, and gourmet chocolates for only thirty nine ninety nine. Okay, look, I have failed in a lot of relationships. Some of them could have been saved, at least for a little while, with a vase of flowers. All right? And this is not just that. It's a teddy bear and some chocolates, too. So even if you miss Valentine's Day, these are a great makeup gift. All right? So there's a couple options here. Pro Flowers is quick and easy. You can't beat the price or convenience. You're out of time, and this deal is too good to pass up, folks. Here's the only way to get this exclusive podcast Valentine's deal. One dozen red roses, including a free vase, chocolates, and a teddy bear for only $39.99. Go to proflowers.com, click on the blue microphone in the top right corner, and type in WTF. That's proflowers.com. Click on the microphone and type in WTF. Order now. This deal expires Thursday or when supplies run out, whichever comes first. Okay? So do that. It might buy you some time. But I don't know. I, I don't know where you're at with your thing. All, all of you know that I went through a difficult breakup this year or last year. It was heartbreaking for me, even though I was the one that decided to do it. And about three months after that or so, you know, I, I went out to dinner with my old friend Moon Zappa, who many of you have heard on the show. Now, this is sort of an in, I don't know. It's a romantic story, I guess. Now, the backstory of this of this romance, this grown up romance that I, I, I'm finding myself in and deciding to talk to you about, is that, you know, I met Moon Zappa probably in 1994, 95, maybe a little before that, but I didn't really know it. I may not have registered it. But she was living in New York doing work for VH1, doing some other stuff, and she was coming out to comedy shows. And when I first met her, I was like, Oh my fucking God. There was just this attraction. There was this chemistry. There was something undeniable, but I was out of my mind. I was a sweaty, drugged up wild man. Just sort of like, ah, what, what, who is this moon? Yeah. What is, what I want this. And, you know, I was just paralyzed and, and completely into her. And, uh, I was with somebody else. But at that time, given the nature of who I was and what was going on, that, that that didn't necessarily stop me. I've been a bad man in my past. So I tried to make it work. I would go on the road. I remember we had, I, I remember getting, she faxed me pictures she drew once. So we were talking and we were uh, engaged in, in, a, in, a, in a dialogue. And I was, you know, beside myself. I was basically in love with her. 94, 95, this has got to be. But there was nothing I could do about it. I wasn't quite married to my first wife yet, but I was close and, you know, I was out of my mind. I was falling, you know, horizontally falling through life. And I wanted to grab on the moon zappa because I felt it. There's a few people in your life and you know who they are. If you're lucky, you're with them. But there's a few people in your life and it doesn't necessarily happen once. I do not believe that there is only one person out there for everybody. And, and I know I'm not the only one that doesn't believe that. That's ridiculous. There's always people out there for you. It's just sometimes hard to find them. And sometimes it depends on where you are in your life. But I, I have been in love a few times, deeply. And uh, and she was one of them at that time. But there was nothing we could do about it. She couldn't handle me. Uh, I was with somebody else. And I was not ready to leave for somebody that couldn't handle me. I think we made out once. Didn't go very far. And that was it. And then I went off and did my life. And uh, went through that marriage. And I don't remember seeing her much during that time. The next time I ran into her, she was married to Paul, her, her ex-husband. And I and I saw them both. And I was like, I just had that pang. And I, you, you know when you see a couple or you see somebody that you had a thing for and, and they seem to have found the right person or that it all makes sense in that moment. And you're like, oh, boy, uh, you know, this, this kind of hurts. But, you know, I guess you know, this is what happens. And, and it seems like it's going to work out. And. They seem groovy, and but it, I just still had that heartache about it, you know. And then I, uh, it, and then I had her on the uh, the podcast, and I think I ran into her. The reason she was on the podcast, I ran into her at a show at UCB, and you know, and I was in in a relationship again. You know, I saw her at UCB, and it just happened to me again. I'm like, oh my god, I should be with her. I should be with her. Why am I not with her? I can't. I'm, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm seeing somebody, and I, I love this person, and you know, I'm, I'm in it. And she wasn't 
she is she was divorced and not and she wasn't with anybody moon wasn't i was like okay okay this is just life this is the ache this is the ache of life you don't always get what you want you don't always end up with the people that you you know you were in love with necessarily you i mean you may love them and you may be in love with them but you know there's always going to be those that one or two people that just fucking knock you the fuck out and for whatever reason you can't be with them for whatever reason it just doesn't happen and that was, you know, that was how I felt about Moon. There was an ache there, but it was just sort of like, well, destiny is not on my side. So then, you know, I have her on the podcast and some of you heard it and there was, you know, the same old juice, man, that was just, you know, we just, it was a shorthand. There was a, there was a click, there was a chemistry there, you know, and I was just, you know, I'm just beside myself, you know, and uh, I just had to accept like, well, there's just, again, one of those things in life and that happens in life, man. I'm an old guy. Well, I'm 50. You know, this happens, you know, if you get around, you live in a few cities, you're going to have some of those things around. So then me and Jessica hit the wall and, uh, you know, that was devastating. And then, you know, a few months after that, I'm like, uh, all right, I got to get, I got to get back out there. I'm going to call Moon. I'm going to ask her out to dinner and, uh, I, I don't know what's going to happen. I'll have any expectations. Uh, but I, I do need to do this. I do need to, to see her. I need to talk to her. I need to, you know, see where she's at and what's going on. I want to talk to her. I want to see her. And so I ask her to dinner and we go to dinner and uh, I really don't have any expectations. I just, I want to see what's there. I want to see what it feels like. So she agrees to have dinner with me and she's in a relationship and I'm like, oh my God, damn it. Are you fucking kidding me? You know, I'm, I'm out. I'm done. I'm beat up. I've learned my lesson. You know, I've always been in love with you. I didn't say that. Are you fucking kidding me? I'm going to play it cool, man. I'm like, what's up with this relationship? Turns out it wasn't that great. She was having some trouble and I related my troubles and, and what I had been through and, and, and she heard me out and then she started thinking about her relationship and, and we got along fucking beautifully and it was just crazy. It was crazy. But I'm like, okay, well, you're in a thing. I get it. Good luck with it. If there's anything I can do to help you, you know, let me know. And I walk away from that thing and I'm like, God damn it. You just got to be cool, man, and see what happens. Because that felt like it was on fire. You got to be cool. Don't freak out. Don't push. Let her fucking do what she's going to do. But God damn it. I, in my mind, I could not let it go. I did not want to let it go. I'm like, I've waited half my life. To be with this person, and I want it more than anything, and I don't know what to do. So we ended up talking again, and being casual, and just being friends, and you know, and, and she was going through a hard time with this this relationship she was in. I was supportive, I was not, you know, pushy, and the miracle happened. The miracle happened is that you know she got out of that relationship, not for me, but because I seemed to had shed some light on some dynamics and whatever. I mean, I'm sure I helped it along, but it was not for me. And she was on the level, man. I mean, you know, she, you know, we didn't do anything when she was in the relationship. It was all on the level. But then all of a sudden it's like, okay, you're out. So what, where are we? What are we doing? And then we went out a few times as friends and it was like, what are we doing? Is this a date? Where are we at? Do we want this? I have love for this person. I have always felt connected to her and, and I can't, I cannot let this fucking slip through my hands. I can't fuck this up. I got to do whatever's necessary here to give this a go. And so we were both stubborn people, uh, you know, somewhat angry people, but you know, we'd been through a lot and we were both willing to do it differently and we wanted to do it differently. So that's what we're doing. We're fighting the good fight and we're having a blast. And that is the best Valentine's Day story that I can tell you. I mean, 1994, 95, 2005, that was 20 years ago that this, this woman struck me right in the goddamn guts and soul and heart. And we've just been missing each other for 20 years. And now we're in it and we're wiser, we're older, we're humbled and we want to change. And we want to make it work and we want to be open and honest and experience happiness and all those things. But, you know, we're used to the other way. So it's been very exciting. I'm sorry this isn't a funny monologue, but uh, but that's my Valentine's Day story. Somehow or another, this thing 
with her came around and I am amazed and uh, and grateful and very much in love with her. And that's the God honest truth. But every day I'm like, I don't want this to go bad. I don't know what I would do if this went bad. I will keep my heart as open as possible. And anytime I begin to do what I used to do that was destructive, I fucking try to put a kibosh on that and be as honest and open as possible and show up for this thing. There's a lot of crying involved. There's a lot of crying to keeping your heart open. Because when it comes right down to it, what are you going to do, man? What are you going to do? You're going to cry or you're going to yell? Cry or yell? I, you know, Try crying. She's crying and you didn't cause it. So how about everybody cries? And maybe that's just the way feelings feel when your your default is anger. Maybe that's what's under it. It's okay. Just cry a little bit. Just cry with each other until you start laughing. Love is a fucked up funny thing. But I, I tell you, it can be amazing if you let it in. I'm not necessarily great at that. But happy Valentine's Day. We're also sponsored today by Squarespace, the all-in-one platform that makes it fast and easy to create your own professional website or online portfolio. And I have a way for you to start a free trial and get 10% off. Squarespace is constantly improving their platform with new features, new designs, and even better support. They have all the options you need to create a unique website for you or your business. Squarespace has an amazing 24-7 support team in New York City. They do live chat during the week and have extremely fast email support throughout the day and night. And Squarespace recently added e-commerce to their platform. This means that literally every Squarespace customer can now begin selling products online. Start a trial with no credit card required and get building your website, folks. When you decide to sign up for Squarespace, make sure to use the offer code CATS to get 10% off and to show you your support for WTF. That's squarespace.com and use the offer code CATS, C-A-T-S, Squarespace. Everything you need to create an exceptional website. All right, so let's talk to Ron White. Ron White, I've been trying to get you on this fucking show for a long time. <laughs> Yeah, I got that uh, 125 city a year thing that uh, kind of stands in my way of uh, of doing fun stuff. And I've wanted to do it for a long time. We've tried to set it up a couple times. You know, you were the last time I saw you. Let me think now. Years ago, you and I were at Montreal. We were on the same showcase. Absolutely. The Remember These Old Guys showcase. Right. Right. Yeah, right. Uh, maybe something will happen for these guys someday again. <laughs> maybe it will. Right. Right. <laughs> yeah. And, yeah, uh, the masters is what they were calling it, but right, what yeah, they meant like was that. the old yeah, guys. Yeah, yeah, that, uh, right, and we both got deals out of that. Uh, yeah, I got a deal with uh, Fox that uh, that 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 built my hopes up so high for the future that I I thought it was uh, I thought it was going to be rosy from there on out. And, uh, Wait, what was that show though? What do you remember the show that you did? Yeah, it was called Senior White, and it was about uh, this time in my life where I'd said fuck comedy and and. Uh, and uh, I moved in, uh, down to Mexico and uh, opened a pottery factory. Did you do that? Yeah, I did it. Oh I boy, really we got. Did. We're gonna have to get the timeline right. <laughs> right, it's it, it's all quite a while ago, but I'd been doing well, whatever. Right around that time, uh, I the blue collar was coming out, and uh, and so I had that big development deal with Fox with more money than I'd ever seen, and and uh, and then. Warner Brothers just committed twelve million dollars to advertising uh, blue collar, and I'm like. Right. Well, this looks great. I'm, I'm going to, I mean, surely I'm going to have my own sitcom because there's no way they would spend this much money <laughs> yeah. and throw it in the trash, right? right. That's impossible. Right. But, and then this movie's coming out and they're going to spend 12 million bucks saying my name. And, uh, and then they changed that to $600,000, which is way less. And, and, uh, and then they didn't pick up the sitcom. So <laughs> a couple weeks later, I'm back at Des Moines at the Funny Bone telling doing jokes. And, doing the comedy. And I'm like, well, I had a chance. <laughs> and, uh, it, it, it just didn't work out. But, uh, but turns it, out in uh, DVD and all that stuff, it all worked out. Great. Yeah, you've done fucking great. You're, you're one of the best there is in my mind. And then the, the time I saw you after that, that was at the uh, improv bar. And, um, you were, uh, you were sitting there. Having a few cocktails, 
That sounds like me. And uh, you were uh, you you had given me like I had just gotten divorced and I was a wreck and you were in the middle of it and you seemed perfectly fine. It was an inspiration to me. <laughs> you, you, you were... I guarantee you I was not perfectly fine during that divorce. I was getting kicked in the ribs on a daily basis, yeah. and I was expected to just like it and shut up. And uh, that was just a, you know, I'm friends with uh, Doctor Phil. I play golf with him every yeah. once in a while. Yeah. And, uh, and not only does he not give unsolicited advice, he doesn't give solicited advice. And, uh, <laughs> yeah. So we're playing golf, and I'm like, Doc, this divorce is killing me. He's like, Keep your head still when you putt. I'm like, <laughs> that was it. Yeah, right. Thanks. <laughs> hey, no, no help no, at all. What, what I'm saying is, <laughs> I feel like I'm dying on the inside, Doc. <laughs> yeah. I don't <laughs> think keeping my head still is going to fix that. Yeah, watch your knees. Watch your knees. <laughs> oh, careful. <laughs> Bend a little bit. I don't know anything about golf, but uh, the first time I, I think I started seeing you. Or no, or like when I met you, I think in Montreal was the first time I really met you. But I'd seen you on TV. But then, like I remember seeing pictures of you uh, at the old uh, the in Houston at the what was that comedy club there? Laugh Stop. At Laugh Stop. Yeah, right. But these were pictures that go way back. A younger Ron White, no gray hair, longer hair in in my recollection. Way longer hair. Uh, right. t- uh, tater salad was on, was in the name. At one time, absolutely, absolutely. So where did where it's did all you... I could do to get it out yeah. of the name? <laughs> I don't need it anymore. Yeah, well, it was gone. It was gone. But that was uh, some at some point. Uh, uh, that was uh, that was part of the the the, the title. Yeah, that, I thought it would be my closer for the rest of my life. So it was based on a bit. Based on a, uh, a yeah, story. A, yeah, a true story. It's, it's my legal alias is Ron Tater Salad White, if you look up my police record. <laughs> or actually, it used to be. It's not anymore because this Texas Supreme Court justice uh, expunged my record. I was talking to him on, uh, I got to have a Ron White day in the state of Texas. And That's a real day? Yeah. They, well, they, they, it, it had a year attached to it, so uh, it doesn't happen every year. They don't bring it up. So. Yeah. <laughs> but they did that one time, and... and uh, I met this uh, Texas Supreme Court justice, and he said, yeah, I was looking at your police record the other day, and I thought, ah, this is bullshit, and apparently there's just a button they can click, and it's That's just it. gone. I'm like, hey, my road manager's name's Steve Cook. Is there any way you could take a look at his? Because I'm having a hard time getting him into Canada. <laughs> yeah, because you, you hit that magic button for right, Canada, yeah, too. Yeah, yeah I, I, I'm, on, uh, I'm flagged in Canada for bullshit, and uh, it's very difficult to get your name off of that shit. Yeah, it is. For bullshit, for nothing. Right. Well, you know, I got that. Uh, I got a plane, and uh, I got busted with weed on it in Florida. So How'd that now, happen? Oh, these guys that were pilots, uh, I fired, and uh, and uh, they were just the biggest dickheads in the world. The guys so who flew you the, around. The guy that flew guys that flew me around. So they, I fired them for just being incompetent. You yeah. Know, fucks and right. And uh, so they start calling the police in towns that I was going to and telling them it was a drug smuggling plane. And uh, so I land in Vero Beach, and uh, and I look out the window, and there's fucking cops and dogs and guns. And I'm like, oh, I wonder what's going on. <laughs> then they, they, they like, stormed yeah. my, my plane. You're and, going on. <laughs> and, 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 and it was the weirdest thing, because they they told them it was a drug smuggling plane. So, okay, if you you got some way to detect that kind of stuff and narc on these guys that are moving meth or whatever or whatever. It's fine. Yeah. yeah. So they come out and they do it. They find less than a gram of weed that yeah. I have a prescription for in my pocket. Yeah. And they took me to jail. It was, it's like they were looking for a rabid pit bull, but they couldn't find one, so they just shot a poodle. Yeah, you know, just, they made the trip. Yeah, there was right. a lot of cars Somebody's involved. going down. They, <laughs> yeah, yeah. they drove by three meth labs and a dead hooker just to <laughs> get to the airport. <laughs> yeah, and, uh, they had a big tip, man. They, they weren't going to be held. They were going to be hung out to dry. So I actually felt sorry for the guys because the, the cops were fans, and, and they were like, oh, this is bullshit. And then some guy, the guy some lieutenant or something said, bring oh, yeah. him in. Yeah, the one guy that didn't know your work. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> the one guy knew he needed to know it. So they, uh, I was actually uh, two hours late to the show, and uh, and and uh, not one person left. They, they were telling him, you know, they were going, "Hey, he's in jail, but it looks like he's getting out." <laughs> and, did uh, you open with it? Oh, sure did. Yeah, right, <laughs> right. Yeah, for five years. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that that was a good that was a good story. And I should have realized that when it was happening, right? You know that it was a good thing. Yeah, you yeah, know, yeah. That, that my yeah. fans would find it completely ridiculous that they did this. Yeah, most of the most of the U.S. would think there's probably a better way to spend their time. Yeah, than uh, than. But I mean, I, I but now on last, a random tip. 
You know, that, Random that, tip. You know, without any fucking research whatsoever. Right. And Alex Ramundo was opening for me, and, and I was on the plane by myself, and I don't know how he got there. I don't remember. But the next week, we were going into somewhere in the Mississippi, and so now we've got a more conservative approach. So we're yeah. not taking any more herb than we can swallow, and we're smoking out of an apple. Yeah. We get there, same thing. And uh, the, the cops, the cops there? And cops, dogs, everything, searching the plane. Alex got a big old jaw full of weed. He, he's eating an apple. <laughs> and as fast as he counts, all the time a lot. And they and it worked. They didn't, they didn't do anything to us. Well, what'd you, how what, how'd you stop these assholes from doing that to you everywhere? There was nothing I could do to stop them. They, uh, they, th- this guy was crazy, crazy. And, uh, he, I mean, crazy, crazy. Yeah, yeah. And, 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 but you would, would never know it to talk to him. He seems real smart. He was a good pilot, but he just went whack on me and I, I, I and I couldn't stop it he was a crazy person that that'll continue to fuck with you as long as he possibly can the sheriff in uh uh Gwinnett County where I live in Atlanta yeah uh his son was in jail in that guy's uh jail yeah in the sheriff's jail and uh he he uh he he just he he opened up a website called uh, redneckshariff.com or what dot or whatever it was and and just to fuck with this guy and uh, he, he flew for Reba McIntyre for a while. And when they fired him, he would send them, you know, boxes of shit. And oh, so he's yeah, fucking nuts. Yeah, fucking nuts. And, and can't go. To, you can't do a restraining order or any of that kind of right. Bullshit? No, 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 no. Now he's kind of quit. Yeah. But before when he'd quit, I would send him a text saying, "Oh, you got motherfucker. Let's, oh, sure. you know, because I can't just let it go. You know, I can't just. Well, why don't I just let it die down? That's and, not one of your things. No, I like to kick it once before I walk away. And, Make sure. <laughs> yeah. See if it's still got any fight in him. Right. So we, you started in Texas. You grew up in Texas. Yeah. I was uh, uh, born in a little dirt town in northwest Texas called Fritch. What's that near? Anything? No. Uh, it's uh, north of Amarillo, about 60 miles up in the Panhandle. Why was your family up there? My father worked for Phillips Petroleum, and uh, Phillips, Texas, is up there, which is where their original refinery was. Was he working on a on a drilling rig or in the factory? Oh no, the no, in the, in the refinery. Yeah, yeah, they went there as ditch diggers. Uh-huh. Uh huh. Your in folks tents. did. My, my my dad did, and his it, family, like the Dust Bowl know. business, pretty much. Yeah, yeah, like digging ditches for what? Yeah, well, it, oddly enough, my grandmother moved to the Panhandle of Northwest Texas at the turn of the last century in a covered wagon. My grandmother. Not my great great grandmother. My yeah. grandmother was yeah. in a covered fucking wagon, and, and, and that was the early 1900s. Right, early 1900s. Right. Right. Didn't right. need a covered wagon, <laughs> but that was that was the situation. That was the situation. Do you right. know where they came from? Oh, uh, you know our our genealogy is not really well traced on either side of my mm-hmm. family. They're Cherokee Indian, but uh, on my mother's side. Oh, and, really? And uh, and she was from Welch, Oklahoma, uh-huh. and uh, so but 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 all really small town folks. Dusty dusty counties in oh, either yeah. way. Oh, forsaken by God Himself. Uh, God <laughs> took time out of His busy schedule to forsake <laughs> this little town, and He forsook the shit out of it too. And then He smoted it. <laughs> he smoted he, it. He smoted it, and then He forsook it, and then He sent in some locusts. It was it's he <laughs> and fucked, that, and he fucked what, the place up. And that's where your great grandma said, "I'm leaving." <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah, about, yeah, about, a, about eighty years later. But for is uh is the same it's a shithole or no total shithole dirt streets to this day uh really yeah dirt streets like is there a was there a town there was there was a town at one time i but there was a little one street thing 700 people yeah we had a grocery store which was a big quonset hut called pages grocery store yeah and my grant my mother was the cashier my mother was smoking hot yeah and uh, so as a little kid, I would sit on the floor by the cash register, and my mother, who was probably 21 or 22, worked the cash register. And uh, <laughs> I used to love the little pickled sausages, the yeah. hot pickled sausages. Yeah, when yeah. I was in a the kid. can? Well, in a jar. Okay. The ones in a jar. Yeah. And uh, I always wanted that, but we didn't have any money, and my mother... I would ask her if I could just go look at them, and I, and I would go over to the shelf and find them, and I'd just stand there and stare at them. It was it was a low end lifestyle. Things were simple. Yeah, things were simple back then. Seven hundred people. So ultimately, you you spent your entire childhood there. No, uh, what happened was they, they they built a lake there. It's called Lake Meredith, which dried up. And uh, was that the idea to get some business in yeah, to, to yeah, get right. some boats? And so when they did, yeah. Piggly Wiggly, uh, the grocery store sure. chain, moved in there with their automatic doors and their fancy highfalutin stuff. Sure, and it ran Pages Grocery Store out of business. 
and then the lake dried up and Piggly Wiggly split and we had no food. Yeah. So there was a re- was, I think it's time to move on here. <laughs> That's uh, an indicator. Yeah, I was the voice of reason at five. Let's, <laughs> let's blow this dump. I can't look at any more sausages. <laughs> right, I'm, I'm getting bored here. So when oh, so how old were you when you left? Uh, we we moved to uh, Deer Park, Texas, when I was about six or seven. And that's I bigger. Guess. Well, it's a suburb of Houston. Oh, okay. So way bigger. So that brought, and your dad was still with Phillips? Yeah, he transferred there, and then I went to uh, work for him, too. So, uh, uh, and then I, I quit when I was 21 or two, and I just uh, was, you know, pushing a button, and I, I didn't see it. And, and uh, my father told me that's the stupidest thing you'll ever do. And two years later, the plant blew to smithereens and killed 17 people on my shift. What? Yeah, leveled it. Adams Terminal. Bud Adams. Yeah. Uh, uh, that was where his money came from. This was, was a refinery? Terminal. Right, refinery. Huh? And it blew up? Blew to smithereens. Well, on the same shift that you used to work? The same shift. Because of a button problem? Because it was a, a disaster waiting to happen anyway. I mean, yeah. you could walk through that thing and you'd smell gas fumes and all kinds of stuff. They didn't give a fuck. They didn't really didn't care at all. And... uh <clears throat> So eventually, the inevitable happened, and it your just, dad uh, wasn't it there. Blew up. Uh, my father was transferred to another refinery by then. Oh, that was lucky. Yeah, right. <laughs> so, right. so you, uh, well, you did you go? So you you stayed in Texas through high school, and then you, you just went to work. Nah, yeah, I joined. Uh, well, I got kicked out of high school, and uh, for what? And uh, I got more than anything else an inability to uh, pay attention for very long. And, yeah. Uh, and then besides, and then I had some little behavioral problems. Uh, yeah. After, but on top of that, like uh, what? Which ones? Oh, uh, you know, I was smoking pot at twelve, which was pretty progressive back then. Yeah. What and, year was that, man? Well, I was born in '56, so 12. Oh, so it was uh, about the right time where everybody was like, <laughs> "What is this?" Uh, right. Well, I, I don't think so back Not then. Yet? What I, the way I got there was my sister was kind of a whore, yeah, and that attracted an older group of guys. <laughs> so I had access to people, you know, three or four years older. But than reefers, me. like it's reefers, not like that. Reefers been around forever with everybody. I mean, you know, the, the I guess the hippies sort of made it famous. But I mean, with 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 musicians and you know beatniks and jazz people. I mean, right, it wasn't a weed new thing. was everywhere. Yeah, right. In Deer Park, it was it was pretty uh, pretty big news. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that the kid was smoking reefer. Right, and they had Alan. Lane Landing in uh, Houston, which was a big hippie scene. And, yeah, uh, that we used to go down there as a family just to look at them. Right, with their flower power and their sure. long hair. And they were something to look on at. Acid yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> like, right, yeah, yeah. I remember seeing them for the first time. I, yeah. All I thought was like, I don't want to be part of that. Wait, <laughs> yeah, night. me too. I'm like, I, I think they're onto something. <laughs> yeah, this seems like the future to me. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you're a little. You're like seven or eight years older than me. Were you in the forces? Oh yeah, I joined the Navy right after that, and after uh, you got kicked out of high school, right? Uh, you go to the uh, Navy. Go to the Navy. What year was that? Uh, seventy four, five, I guess. So we were we were, we were out of the game by then. There was a, like a pause period in terms of wars, right? Uh, it was tail end of the Vietnam War, so probably seventy four. We, we we our little boat was called the USS Conserver, which a few years ago they had to spend a hundred thousand dollars to sink it. And that's how useless this boat was. It was commissioned in '36, and had you got bad luck with equipment, I know. refineries, boats. Yeah, right. All of them, <laughs> cell phones, all of them. What? What was? Uh, what was your job on the boat? Like I what, was a quartermaster, which is a, in, a, in the Navy is a navigator. And so and, I tested real high. I, got, I had really off the chart math skills, and uh, but outside of that, there was really no other shining light. But if you test, you know, you take that test, and then. It shows you a big list of if you where your score is, what you can do, and and I mine was fine, so I I got that I got a pretty good job. Where'd you go on the boat? I was uh, stationed at Pearl Harbor on uh, Oahu, Oahu, and then we went on uh, West Pack to the Philippines and uh, uh, all kinds of stops over there, Hong Kong and. Uh, Korea. It took us 31 days to get from uh, Hawaii to Korea. That's what a piece of shit this boat was. 31 days <laughs> and, uh, of, of slow fucking... You know, Did you enjoy showing. it at all, though? You know what? I didn't mind it, uh, but by then I was eating acid. And, on and, the boat? Uh, uh, on the boat. Really? And, yeah, and uh, and just smoking. It's just unbelievable weed. Not unbelievable today, but, but- back then the, those Maui tops were... Really off the charts. So were the uh, other dudes with you? You're just all hanging out on the boat, tripping balls. We're tripping balls, smoking weed, try, and then eventually <laughs> we got into a little bit of uh, heroin over in uh, in Hong Kong, and and then they did a random drug check on the ship, and yeah. I came up positive. 
And uh, and back then there there just wasn't any other drug, but they, in Hong Kong you could find heroin and there, you you could take take a, like a tip of a match and split it eight ways. And because it was so powerful. It was so yeah. Just, How'd you do it? Just snorted it. Yeah. And uh, so uh, anyway, I came up positive for that. So they flew me on a medevac flight uh, in a in a in a big cargo plane with no windows to. From Iwakuni, Japan, yeah. to uh, to Guam, and then to the Naval Air Station in uh, San Diego, where they had the, the Naval Drug Rehabilitation Center. So they and, put you uh, in rehab. They put me in rehab, where all the drugs were. <laughs> that's where the good drugs. Where we found the really good drugs, and <laughs> and uh, so and and that didn't work out very well. So uh, they gave me an honorable discharge with medical condi- under medical conditions and. And uh, so with full benefits and and, really? and kicked me out after 18 months and three days of service. And you have to do at least 18 months to uh, to get your So you got benefits. 18 months and three days, and you yeah. get VA benefits now. Well, I, I don't know what they are, but, <laughs> but, no, but, <laughs> but if I wanted them, yeah, I guess so. I could go to a VA hospital or something like that. My first house was bought on a you know VA loan. And, really? Uh-huh. That, I mean, that's a, that's a good story because they, they didn't fucking... They, they didn't read the fine print. <laughs> <laughs> but they didn't rail you either. No, they didn't. They really didn't. And that's, uh, I guess that, you know, after Vietnam, the, the, the bar had been set fairly, you know, high for for what a real fuck up was in in the sense of drugs and whatever I mean right. I can't even imagine what they dealt with during that war in terms of people coming back in terms of drugs in terms of everything else well you know a lot of those drug avenues were left open you right. know, after the war you know a lot of <laughs> there were people that still were running drugs out of out of uh, South Vietnam military. and, and uh, yeah military yeah, yeah, yeah. operations yeah. Right. I mean, they were not. They, they didn't have a genuine flag or anything, but it was the same guys that were there going, "Hey, well, what, why don't we just keep on doing this?" Oh, I see what you mean. Once they got out of the forces, they were like, yeah. "We we open these channels. Why why, why <laughs> close down the shop?" Right. No, nobody said anything. <laughs> yeah, we can still get on a plane. <laughs> right. Oh, that's unbelievable. So then, after that, you went to the refinery, and then then what were the what what was the life plan, Ron? What was the life plan early on? Did you get married? Oh, my, my 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 overall plan was maybe something needle happen. <laughs> That was my <laughs> that, was, that uh, was my retirement plan. Yeah, like, yeah. I'll wait it yeah, out. Yeah, see see if something neat doesn't happen, and uh, so it, it, you know, and it, and it you know turned out by chance that it did. You know, that, yeah. uh, that it did, did it. You know, it ended up being a. Oh, it's still going. I'm still doing 125 cities a year, so it's it's you know still working. But you started in Houston. Started in no, I started in uh, Dallas. Or Arlington, Texas. At what the year was bone. that? At the funny eighty six. Well, what the hell were you doing previous to that? Just hanging around. Well, I then I had a real drug problem uh, from in my early late teens, the early twenties. Uh, I was probated to a drug abuse program. What was that drug? Uh, what was that drug? That yeah. was a mixture of any it, almost anything. Yeah. But, uh, but I did uh, have so, to go through a period of time where I really liked needles and yeah. I, I, I was fucked up. I mean, I was lost. I didn't know which way to go. Uh-huh. Uh huh. I was having a hard time finding my way through the landscape of life, as most people do. And the needles are, and, are not the. They don't help. They don't. That's not a good uh, journey. Right. No. A, no. So I needed to quit. And what were and, you banging? Uh, speed. Um, you know, uh, yeah, yeah, more speed than anything else. And, uh, <laughs> yeah, I, and I never, uh, started doing, uh, heroin again. And, uh, yeah. which I only did about three times ever right. in my whole well, life. That, you're so. lucky that, that that didn't take. Right. Yeah. Cause that's lucky. a hard one to kick. I mean, speed, you know, you're usually exhausted by the time you, <laughs> right. you have to stop. <laughs> yeah. So, and, 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 and I never really had a budget for, uh, cocaine. It was my lack of money that kept me alive. Oh, Cause see, if I would have had unlimited cash oh, then. Who the fuck knows? Right. Yeah. It would have been over so you're doing that quick. shitty biker speed yeah well yeah for the most part <laughs> yeah there were there was some uh some pharmaceutical stuff and i just can't remember the placid that no the placid was a barbiturate a pound, pain killer yeah barbiturate right. placid right. yeah oh so you really I used to call the dents in my car placid dents <laughs> <laughs> so, so you fucking you were a warrior I, yeah you know i had a uh a you know, I, I was taking a run at it. Yeah, I was taking a run at it. So uh, I was in that program for like three years. So, oh, really? Yeah. So, and that uh, was a, a state program kind of deal, or it was called the Palmer Drug Abuse Program. It was independent, kind of uh-huh. a twelve step deal, uh-huh. but uh, like one different step, right? Or that they were taking credit <laughs> they, for the they whole took, thing. They took one step out. Yeah, it's, one, yeah. it's eleven step program. Yeah. So uh, no, they added one. Was that your uh, folks doing? I mean, did they? You know, were they? Like, no, no, that was the courts doing. The, the, the court uh, <laughs> made me go to it. Too many placidents. Uh, yeah, too <laughs> many placidents. And uh, <laughs> so when I got out of that, and I, you know, I went back to smoking pot, but never went back to anything else and yeah. drinking. And, yeah. Uh, 
uh, which I've kept up a thorough. Uh, yeah, yeah, habit yeah, yeah. Throughout you're, the you're, years, yeah, you still uh, are hard at work at that. All right. Somebody, I did our interview this morning. Somebody said, "Well, there's a big rumor that you quit drinking." I said, "Well, go on YouTube, and you can see footage of me fully dressed in a suit with a cigar and scotch diving into a mermaid tank." So <laughs> you're not real sober when you start diving into the mermaid tank. You got some bad information there. All right. You got some bad information. Well, do you ever think about stopping? Oh, you know, I did for uh, for about six months a few years ago. Uh, I was I was going through the divorce, and uh, right before I got into that divorce, that's the second divorce. I was uh, second or third. There was yeah. that there was that tall chick. I can never remember her name, and uh, <laughs> well, Jennifer or Betty. Or, do you have kids? Uh, something I do. I have a twenty three year old son named Marshall. Who's so you've a been great married kid. two or three times, and you got one kid. That, I mean, you got to. That's I've been good. married. Three times, but another relationship that was pretty long that I, that I never uh, married. So uh-huh. now I'm married to uh, Alex Ramundo's. Uh, do you know Alex? Uh, uh, I think I met him. Yeah, probably. He's been around here for a while. And, uh, it's his sister. He and I started to stand up together. And uh-huh. His sister's a, a, a just a beast of a singer, as good as it gets. And, and you and, think uh, you got this one right now? <laughs> I don't know. It seemed like it till earlier today. I like, oh no! She, she, she walked out of the door crying and slammed the door. So I'm like, "Well, this isn't going great, is it?" It's, it's a day to day thing, huh? No, I love her to death, and I, I really believe in her. And uh, she, I've just never met a more uh, talented human being. And well, that's beautiful. She man. buzzes around here uh, doing uh, voice work, but her band is stellar, and uh, she's got a set of pipes that uh, I, <clears throat> we spent our holidays with uh, Brian Johnson. From ACDC? From ACDC. Really? Yeah, he, we got to be friends with him and his wife, Brenda. And where we were you? Uh, in Fort Lauderdale, where they live. And, Brian uh, Johnson lives in Fort Lauderdale? Uh-huh. Huh. Uh, no, no, he doesn't. He lives in Sarasota. I'm sorry. Okay. Sarasota. And uh, I watched her make him cry. Uh, Brian Johnson, big old tear like, running out of his from lines, From her singing? Just singing a jazz standard in his living room. Oh, that's yeah. beautiful. <laughs> so that must so, be a uh, hell of a living room. ACDC money's got to be pretty large. It's got it. Yeah, you know, it's a nice spread they've got over there. Uh, it's got just this killer bar that uh, that's a pub. You know, it's just a big English pub in the house. And above it in stained glass windows above the door, it says, for those about to rock. I'm like, I love this place, man. I but, love ACDC. Yeah, me too. Me too. And I, like, and I, I don't think i could even i don't know that because of his hat that i could identify that man i think i've only seen the lower part of his face yeah he's uh <laughs> he's not a very big guy none of them are is and, he british uh yeah and the yeah, rest he's are british. australian yeah i think so so were they all right. hanging around were you hanging around with angus and uh, now they really uh you know they really don't like each other very much oh really and, uh, it's like that but brian is a great guy and, uh, he, he, you know i can't understand much of what he says he's like run me my foot my cunt my but we were, we were having dinner <laughs> yeah. with him in this restaurant, and there were like eight of us at our table, and we were loud and drunk. And there were two other tables in there, uh, more tables than that, but they they take care of Brian. They yeah. love him in that town. Yeah. Everywhere he goes, people are just go crazy Fucking about royalty, him. royalty, man. Right, he yeah. is. And so we're over there. We're being loud, and there was a couple over there, and this guy, who pretty big guy, comes over to us, and he goes, very, very huffy with his chef puffed out. Yeah. And he goes... I'm on, uh, I, I've taken my girlfriend out for her birthday, and I would appreciate it if you'd quit using the F word. And Brian goes, What if I quit using the F word? How would I tell you to fuck off? <laughs> How did that play? <laughs> yeah, right. Did that? Well, they, they, they got a little, uh, the, the guy got a little loud, and then, uh, they, th- they threw him out for, uh, questioning our, uh, our language. Yeah, they, don't, uh, don't fuck with Brian. Yeah, don't fuck with Brian, whatever you do. So when you started in Dallas, who were the guys? I mean, wait, wait, you're, so you, you got cleaned up and you bounced around. Then you, what was the first, what was the incentive to do stand up? I mean, where'd that come from? I, you know, my, they built a, that, a comedy club between where I lived and where I worked, selling windows and doors and, and uh, the guy, guy, guy that I worked with uh, at the time, so Sam Bartholomew, uh, he went to the first open mic night, and he yeah. came down to the office the next day, and he goes, hey, you're funnier than these guys. You should go do this. And so here we are, yeah. 20, 27 years later. So who who was, uh, you know, who'd you start out with in Dallas? That oh, are still uh, Ed Yeager was there. I mean, I don't know anybody that was still around. Really? Uh, yeah. That, but, but Ed is a big TV writer out here, so he would be the most successful. Uh-huh. Uh, Gene McGuire. I don't know if you know any of these guys. Most of them really were only, 
There may be only one or two guys that ever even did it professionally, and it was a bunch of guitar acts and stuff. Back then, there was a lot of guitar acts around. Well, in Dallas, there was. Now, uh-huh. they wouldn't tolerate it in Houston. Uh-huh. Uh huh. Well, but that's because there was a that was a higher bar for <laughs> a way higher bar. That yeah. is, they they established that early on at the uh, what was the the workshop the right workshop right. And so you're in Dallas. How far? That's like three and a half hours from Houston. Something like that. Yeah, I think so. So now, like, and this was the '80s. Mm-hmm. Right? Yeah. 86. 86. So things were happening in, in Houston, right? Right, right, right. K- Hicks and Kennison and Riley Shock and, and, right, uh, and Greenlee uh, and uh, uh, Pineapple. Jimmy Pineapple. Jimmy Pineapple. Right. Right. Yeah. And, uh, right, and Kennison was, uh, was around. So when you're in Dallas, was there, did you feel, did you feel like uh, something was going on up there? Uh, you know what? I knew really early on that, that I was going to be, that I was, very comfortable there you know on on stage, on stage. doing stand up and and uh i had done other stage related things before because when i i actually went to work for the drug abuse program and uh so i became their primary public speaker and so i would go around every day to high schools full of kids and tell my life story of addiction addiction and uh and and it got funnier and funnier and funnier and uh, <laughs> and I was so comfortable Were doing it. Were you killing it with great. the high school kids? I was. I could make them think. I could make them laugh. It was. It was. It was great. And so when I started doing stand up years later, uh, when I was twenty nine, I, I wasn't near as afraid of it probably as a lot of guys were. And and uh, and I got to where I could I could kill. I only had four minutes, but the four minutes I I, I figured out how to make it go. Was it know? one it was story? Pretty, uh, it was. I think it was four stories in the, in the one minute, but or the, in the four minutes. Because you but. were always long form, right? You weren't doing jokes. Oh, no, no. Always, uh, it's always been hard for me to take off and land quickly. Yeah. Uh, I've, I was, I've, I've always prepared to do uh, and still do. I'm always a little out of my element whenever I pop into a comedy club to do a 10-minute set because I'm just so used to getting into it. Right. There's no uh, way to uh, establish uh, yourself. And, you know, it takes, it's going to take about five, even if I imagine, even though you are this huge act now, I mean, for you to, to, to get started, it's about eight minutes, right? Yeah. I, I just wind in it pretty slowly. And, uh-huh. uh, and, and, uh, so, but more than anything else, it's just, uh, you know, I'm just uh, used to just big venues and, and with, you know, with, with just full of my fans yeah. and that, uh, that, that'll let me get away with, I mean, you still got to bring it, right? But uh, but you know, they're they're there to laugh at me. You know, they paid to do it, so you know they're they're usually pretty soft. So and, when you did uh, Houston, or did, I mean, when you would go up there to work at that, did you work at the workshop and at the? Uh, I know I, you, I went there and did sets, and then yeah. I ended up working at the uh, the, laugh the stop. laugh stop. Was where I never worked at the other one. I went in there and did a set one time really early on, and and uh, they just stared at me. Really? And uh, yeah. What? Why? It was mostly the other comics. Well, what was there? What? 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 What did they think you were doing? They, wrong? they just thought I was a hack, you know, which yeah. I was. I mean, just pretty, you know, just kind of a new guy. You yeah. Know, just trying to figure it out. Right. So. So they gave you the stink eye. They gave me the big the back wall. They, and they gave it to everybody too. They, you know, if who you was in that group? Was that? Uh, was it Riley oh, and Tracy? Yeah, all those guys. Uh, Jimmy Pineapple used to drive all the way across the city to. A Ignore me. So he, he'd go to a club I was working in and sit at the bar and not pay attention to me. Uh, so, huh. Isn't it weird, man? Yeah, it is weird. He, well, he, but, you know, pineapple's always been crazy. But they're all crazy. Yeah, You're crazy. Yeah, yeah, the ones that are still around. <laughs> right. But when I saw pictures of you at the at the last stop, there was long hair, you had a mustache. Right. I, I've had more looks than Madonna. But you leveled off. I mean, you, this has been it for a while. Yeah, right. Uh, well, I, you know, I was always a rock guy. That, and they were always trying to kind of push me into a country thing because of the way I talk. But, uh, you know, I, I, I came up. Who was trying uh, to push you? Uh, well, it, it, it just seemed like that, uh, that the crowds were more responsive if I put it on a little bit. Uh huh. And so you, you have all kinds of temptations, you know, when you start doing stand up to, sure. to find an easier way to do it. And our, my manager there, a guy named JP uh, Williams, who's as big a prick as has ever lived. And, He's Foxworthy's manager. Yeah. And Larry the Cable Guy's manager. He was, and Bill's, and mine. Yeah. And, uh, but he prefers, you know, a lap dog type of client. You know, uh-huh. he doesn't like anybody that tells him what they think. And so we got in a big fight. And, and, but he was trying to get me to be more like Bill and Jeff and Dan. You got to be corporate clean. You're, and I'm like, I don't think I do. I think I, I think the only thing that matters is, is that I'm true to my nature. 
because that's what they make a connection with when I'm myself. And there's plenty of people out there that smoke and drink and like to go listen to live music and all the shit I like. So yeah. I'm gonna, I'm going to be myself and 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 see who dances. So well, so that was a discussion you had when he started in with those guys. With him, that was the direction he wanted me to go. So where, where, before that, though, were you friends with Bill with Hicks? At no, all? We, oh, I, no, I, I I knew him, uh, but I was just a, a goo goo eyed, you know, fan. But uh, but uh, but he was a kid, right? When you met him, pretty well, much. Well, no, he was uh, maybe twenty uh, seven or eight uh-huh. when I met him. Uh, I mean, his legend had been along around comedy more than longer than that for sure but by the time you but first by the time him? i met him you know he I, I i probably didn't know him for six years before right. he died and uh, so i would just come out to every time he'd do a set and, yeah and uh like all the other comics you yeah know, and sit back there in wonderment and go, yeah I'm, I'm, i suck <laughs> i just i'm the worst what am i doing right yeah he must have been something to see then i can't i, I would have liked to have seen him in texas really because that was really, uh, I mean, that's where it all sort of uh, started for him, right? And he, and he, that's where probably you know where he had the biggest following. Uh-huh. Uh huh. But he, he used to do really, really well at the Laugh Stop in Austin. Yeah, yeah I've worked that room. Yeah. I've worked the front room and the back room, depending on <laughs> the size of the crowd, right? <laughs> I, I, I tell you what, I could, I always worked there and I always did well there, but I couldn't draw forty people. I yeah. mean, it just, I, and and now. They could put a, just a little thing on the uh, on on their website saying there's going to be a special guest, and if they know I'm in town, because uh, I won't let them use my name if I still got tickets to sell over here. Yeah, I'm really just trying to work out some new stuff. Yeah, and uh, so they, you know, then they get 150 people, and I'm like, well, we couldn't beg 150 people to come see me at one time. And uh, that's a good feeling, isn't it? Uh, yeah, yeah, it's very, you know, it's, it's great. And then I get to, you know, I'm, I'm working, I'm doing the shooting of the salute to the troops. Uh, right four which is something i do on the 18th on the is it 18th february 19th 19th right and that's going to be live on uh cmt it's it's not going to be live so oh, okay. thank god i did something live for him this year and it was nerve-wracking and unnecessary well, why what happened oh is this a stupid award show that they asked me to do and you and, hosted uh, it i hosted it and uh and they, they wanted to do it live for some reason uh-huh and the day before <clears throat> the uh the monitor uh went out five times and I'm like, well, if this happens tomorrow, I'm fucked because I'm not off book with any of this shit except the monologue. You mean the prompter? The prompter, yeah. right? Just wouldn't go completely out. right. And then so that just made me tense and feel anxiety and stuff. And did then, you drink more? I, I, you know, well, I drank. I yeah. don't know if I drank more, but I yeah. drank. And and they, you know, I, I'm really. I don't, I don't hate country music, yeah, but I but I really just don't listen to much of it, you right? Know? So I, the new I, stuff I, I really, or ever, the, yeah, the no the new stuff at all, yeah, and uh, but not because I mean basically it's rock and roll. I mean, sure. they're screaming guitars on sure. every yeah. song. It's all and, changed into pop music, right? Into, yeah, into popular music. You're exactly right. So. So when they ask me questions, they they really think that I have this deep knowledge of country music when I do have a deep knowledge of rock and roll, but right. not country. And uh, yeah. they ask me, uh, what country tunes are you playing this day, these days? And I'm like, uh, well, the Almond Brothers is yeah. that a <laughs> is that a country band at all, or what is that? Well, that's a weird thing, man, because. Yeah, I grew up in New Mexico, and you know there was this assumption that there. there and, and it's interesting to me that that when you had the first conversations with your manager about about you know country fans, is that most of the great you know Southern rock and a lot of great American rock music comes all out from there, comes out out of you know the South and out of Texas Absolutely. and everywhere else. But there's this there's the, there is this weird separation that there's a type of consumer, a type of fan. That you know, country music fans have gotten this weird kind of rednecky reputation, but most of them are rock guys at heart. Oh, what of, the bands themselves? Well, the, not the, the, yeah, the of bands, they are. and even the fans. Though it's weird. There's nobody. I, I can't imagine there are people that only listen to fucking country music. Is that true? Oh yeah, yeah. Oh definitely. There are those. People. Oh yeah, tons of them. <laughs> it's the biggest dem. They sell more country albums than they do rap albums. That's the biggest demographic of music, uh, the, the the money they make. And those people, you're Not, telling me they didn't listen to Bob Seger, they didn't listen to, uh, you know, to, to, I don't know why I picked Bob Seger, because he's a big crossover. In, uh, you, absolutely. They, they but, must have. 
I, you know, I, they, well, I guarantee the bass player paid, played for him, you know, yeah. that, that, because all those guys are session right, guys right. From, that came from, from rock and right. couldn't make a living doing rock. So they moved to Nashville. So they changed and, country to rock. Right. So and, they, right. They, yeah. they made a transformation to yeah. a place they fit and yeah. get a job. And, uh, Isn't that something, man? And, and just mega talented guys. I mean, I know a lot of them and I have a lot of respect for them. We're good friends with the guys from Rascal Flats just because we end up at the same place a yeah. lot and they're yeah. great guys. And, yeah. And uber talented, uh, that, uh, that they're, uh, you know, Gary Lavox or whatever his name is, is just one of the best singers alive. Where do you uh, live? Alive. Uh, Montecito. Oh, you live in town. I thought you had a place in Atlanta or somewhere. I do. Oh, you do? Yeah. You, you like Georgia? I like it. I, yeah, I like Georgia fine. I, uh, it, it's, uh, it's pretty. It's proximity to the eastern seaboard is, you know. So it's just good practicality and, while you're there? Yeah. Uh huh. Yeah, because you just can't. It's, it's hard to hit all those cities from over here. You got an extra day of travel going and coming. Right. Uh, if you come out of LA. So. Right. I so guess. now, okay. So you did stand up for how long before? Cause, you know, I did one of my first middle weeks for Foxworthy before, long before, uh, the, the redneck thing. Right. Yeah. He was just a guy. Telling stories. I remember he closed with some bit about, you know, someone. I don't know if it was dad, if it was his dad or him. He was, you know, all fucked up on a boat that was on a trailer. Right. Now, I, right, I, don't, right. I, I don't know how far back those, that goes. Long way. Right. A long way back. But he's always a sweet guy. And, you know, in, in a, in a, you know, uh, you know, he's become something, you know, very different. But he was just a comic. Yeah. You know, he was just a, the redneck thing had not taken hold. How long were you doing straight up storytelling stand up before these guys approach you? And how did that happen? Uh, well, I met Jeff the first day I did stand up. Uh, uh, Jeff was the headliner in the Arlington Funny Bone that week, and he was at the Fort Worth Funny 86. Bone in '86. Yeah, so I met him in like '89 or '90. Right, and he was a headliner. Right. And so, well, he was the headliner that week, but he, he, but you couldn't fly home. You know, you had to do both those clubs. They right. weren't going to fly you back home, and you weren't going to fly yourself back home. So he he just came out to open mic. And I went up there and did my four minutes, and uh, and he came up to me afterwards and goes, "Hey man, you're really funny, but you need to put the punchline at the end of the joke." <laughs> and I was like, "Wow, how do you do that?" <laughs> and uh, so this is how generous the guy. It takes a brand new comedian. Yeah, I don't have much of this in me. Yeah, uh, and and restructures. He said, "If you say this part here and this part here, then the funny parts last, and then you can stare at them and uh, they'll laugh." And and I'm like, oh, and, oh, and he okay. was right. He was totally right. I mean, it, it, it's just a way to structure a a joke. It's kind of hard to know. Remember now what, how what, to do it wrong. What but, were you doing? Burying the lead? You yeah, just I, I just uh, whatever the, I would say that was funny. I still had more information to give you, so I'd step on the laugh. And, right, right, uh, so, right. And he just showed me how not to do that. So he changed your uh, way of thinking. <laughs> yeah, as far as joke, <laughs> joke structure uh, goes. But your bits are like usually. You know, I mean, I imagine you see them as jokes, but I mean, there's several tags. You know, in the course of a story. Yeah, they're, you know, they, it, 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 really they are jokes. Sure. And, no, uh, yeah. uh, but, it, it, and that's just the only way I know how to do it is in story form. Mm -hmm. I just can't write another way. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and, and that's where most of my stuff comes from because I just don't have the, uh, attention span to sit down and really, try to write you got to talk through uh, it uh yeah i got to talk through it i right. work i don't even have a notebook never yeah. have so yeah. i just work I, it wanders into my head and the keep funny stuff it. and and then i keep doing it and uh and that's one of the reasons i do a an ass load of shows because it's hard to do this part-time and stay sharp at it you know it's hard for me i gotta keep all that information floating at the top and right the, oh yeah because the longer i go man, the deeper it sinks and, right or you lose hours i mean uh, you know you see if you because i do it the same way i'm just a conversationalist so right. then you know, if you're not having the conversation, you don't know what the fuck you're talking about. Exactly right. <laughs> right. So, okay, so you meet you meet Foxworthy in '86. So that how does that relationship? When did I mean you still had a build? So how did uh, you evolve into this blue collar comedy thing? Well, you know, I got a <clears throat> my my biggest uh, my my big early early break was uh, I got to open a show for Sam at the Dallas County Convention Theater and, for Kennison uh, for Kennison. And, uh, which was a makeup date, a date that he had missed. What and year was that? I'd say, yeah, I'd say 89. Yeah. Uh, maybe, yeah, 89. I knew, him, I knew him just before that. You know, I was at the comedy store as a doorman in 87. So he, by 89, he was way gone. Yeah, right. Yeah. yeah. He, but, but he was, uh, I get there and it's me and, uh, uh, he, and he's not there. So there, his brother's there, Bill. Yeah. But he's not, and uh, and so there's two thousand people out there, just all rabid Kennison fans, and 
And uh, and so we're just sitting back there, and Bill goes, hey, listen, sometimes Sam's uh, opening act is a bit of a sacrificial lamb. So if they start screaming, yeah. just because they want to see Sam. Yeah. So, But I went out there and had the best set of my whole life. They loved me. <laughs> that was great. What, and do you, what do you think it was? I mean, what did you do? I mean, that's a hell of a warning. I mean, was there any sense that they were uh, against you when you walked out? There was a sense that Bill didn't know what the fuck he was talking about. Mm-hmm. Or maybe they weren't really into LeBeau at the time, but I, who I've always thought was funny. He's great. And uh, He went out there and he... he no, he didn't. He, he was in rehab or some yeah. hab or something uh-huh. or his wife was but right. he couldn't make it so they called me literally the day i did it and you were in texas so yeah i didn't have time to fret it i right. just went down there and did it so right and then i got ended up there were some people there that own comedy clubs and they offered me a basically a job working 50 years weeks a year on the road as a middle act really huh which clubs were that funny bone and uh, punchline no kidding. Yeah. So that was it. So you were like uh, on you, the road. Yeah. Had a job. Yeah. Easy to book and uh, making five hundred bucks and uh, yeah, yeah. But you got and, you paid your dues. You got the time in. Right. So I was I, I I took off you know down the road in a little Nissan pickup truck and uh, and uh, you know like everybody else I'd drive eight hundred miles to to yeah <laughs> to, to yeah. make no yeah. money yeah. almost Do and it, and, it, and was and was pumped about it sure you man know, absolutely but pumped. you weren't carrying any you weren't were you married at the time i was oh yeah. so that you know, strained yeah. it yeah so yeah right so i'm I'm tagging around some regret <laughs> you know that's uh, which gets heavier and heavier and uh <laughs> so and uh you know inevitably she's the one that didn't want to be married to uh to somebody who was always going to be on the road and uh tricky and, business is that yeah. the one the mother of your kid yeah uh-huh and uh she was just at my show in Charlotte, and I'm, I'm really, I mean, she's been a great mother to my child, and I just really do love her. And Oh, you guys are okay. Oh, yeah, we're to, no, totally solid, oh, totally that's, solid. That's fucking good. Uh, I even like her husband, who's who, who I'm the luckiest man in the world to get this guy for a stepfather for my son. Good guy. Because he's a solid motherfucker. Really, kind, of, kind of a... a kind of the different end of the spectrum than me, which yeah. is fine. Yeah, you know? and, sure. Uh, so and, and my son went on the road with me from the time I had joint custody. So he's three years old. Me and him are in a in a van driving down the road <laughs> doing gigs. And really? I, and I don't even know what to do with a three year old. I'm like going. What did you do with him? I was waiting for him to get old enough to eat McDonald's so I could get some <laughs> trans fats down here. <laughs> Later, <laughs> taste this. Man, we'd sleep in the van, and uh, it, so I, it, it's weird because I get a, a, a lot of comments that I shouldn't talk about the success part of it. And uh, Fox what do you Worthy mean? What always does that mean? Uh, to, to to act like you didn't make money doing it, you know, to talk about uh, almost to talk about somebody else's life. Some lady attacked me after a show in in uh, Dallas the last year. Yeah, and she told me she was a social worker and she didn't appreciate all the all the bragging I did about yeah. all the stuff. And I'm like, hey, it's not my fault. I didn't buy one ticket. I didn't buy one album. And, uh, and, and I used to do it for almost nothing and, and nobody seemed to care about that. What do you mean? What, what is she talking about? You, when you talk about the way you <clears> raised <throat> your kid or, or taking uh, no, them on? No, no, no. If I mentioned the plane or, oh, oh, and, oh. I, and I used to, I'd, I'd have a plane that you guys bought me because I would tell a story right, about it. Right. It's still part of my life. So I still have to, uh, you know, I, there's nothing else to write about but your life. That's sure. it. And, uh, so whatever that is, you gotta, that's where you're at. So, but you got flack for that. Even Foxworthy said you gotta stay, keep calm and Well, keep that common. was, you know, he just certainly never gave me any flack about it, but he said, D- 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 never, ever mention the money. Uh, you know, so. Isn't that interesting? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. But so, did, did you, I, and I thought kind of people like a small town boy makes good, you know, stories. Well, there's, it and, goes and, either way. It goes either way, right. And, and, you know, I, I think that's interesting because ultimately what I learned recently is whatever they're coming at you with, they're projecting it onto you. Like, you know, yeah. you're still an entertainer and you still do and you're talking about your life. But if if you're going to represent the thing that they don't have and they're going to say, fuck that guy, you know, yeah, then that's that's the way they're going to be. Exactly right. Exactly now, but right. like I, I thought you were going to say the social worker got on you for, for driving your three year old around in a van. No, she had no problem with that. I didn't. I... <laughs> And the kid turned out all right. Oh, yeah. He's a great kid just out of college. Uh, uh, got a degree in recording arts, which oh, really? is uh, almost useless. And, and uh, I mean, it's just the, the, the recording arts jobs, recording arts, the engineer jobs, they don't exist anymore because anybody with a... Uh, garage or, band, yeah. Or, yeah, right. But it must feel great to, you know, to, to come from like that to, you know, having this, 
this custody situation where you got to go do a shit gig in middle and bring a three year old with you and find a waitress to watch him while you're on stage, I imagine, or whatever. Right. And then, uh, and then to be able to, to send the kid to school and to be supportive and let him do what the hell he wants to do. And, and I, I and to hear you say that, you know, the stepfather was a good guy. I mean, that's an important thing. Oh, it's, you, it's everything. Yeah. I mean, you don't know what the hell is going to happen with that or right. you've got no control over that woman Absolutely anymore. Absolutely none. Absolutely none. And it, and it worked out. Yeah. It worked out. It worked out great. And, uh, uh, so, and, and he's a great kid. He works for me now. He works for me. I got a VIP experience where people can come back and, you know, take pictures and ask yeah. questions and sing songs or whatever. So when did you start touring with the blue collar thing? Cause this is what's just interesting to me because in, in my mind, you know, your comedy is not, doesn't need to be pigeonholed. You, you know, you're a guy that does funny shit. You tell funny stories. You got some darkness in you. All the good stuff is there for great comic. Uh, which you are, but I think that some people of my generation or some people of my ilk, you know, will sort of set the blue collar thing in a different place. They're like they'll assume it's not for them. But even the young guys that are, are, are in that world are great comics. I just don't think that there's a, right. a, enough crossover. Ron, I'm trying to trying to bring your <laughs> going to get the alt kids on the wrong white bus, right? Um. You know that uh, the I was kind of a counterbalance, I think, to Dan and uh, Dan Whitney, Larry, the cable guy, and uh, so I think it worked, and we all were friends. How they pull that. you in, though? What was the what was the plan? I was already opening for Jeff. Okay, uh, I, I I remained Jeff friends with Jeff that entire time, and when he basically when he got big enough to take somebody with him, he took me with him. Right. So he kind of pulled me. And out you were of the strong clubs too, man. That's and, it. yeah, right. He wasn't. Uh, <laughs> wasn't afraid. He wasn't afraid. But also, I played by his rules because he's always been a clean comic. So I would never do, you know, I would never say fuck. I would, you know, I would try to really? do. Really? Yeah. Yeah. And not that he ever said anything about it. I but just you like, knew. Yeah, I knew. Yeah. I knew that yeah. uh, there's no sense in him doing a show because he likes to sell tickets to. He's from the uh, Leno school. Of, if you do a clean show and sell tickets with the grandparents, the yeah. parents, the kids. and Okay. And, I, and I'm more of a don't bring your fucking kids to my show yeah i don't want that's, that's, that's not, okay with you don't want to be responsible for what right. goes in his head right yeah. Yeah, yeah do that at your own risk yeah so uh you know so i just you know saw uh it was a good job to have he paid me really well and uh so i thought well i can just uh do it you know i if i if my stuff's not blue for the sake of being blue right it's just who i am so i write stuff that's that's perfectly clean too and yeah. so i just picked those jokes and you know did a show in front of them and then um, the Kings of Comedy got real huge, and and uh, Bill was traveling with um, Bill Ingvall. Yeah, Bill Ingvall was t- traveling with uh, Craig Hawksley uh, out of St. Louis, uh-huh. and so they just put those two tours together, uh-huh. and uh, it worked like a charm. The blue collar, tour. and uh, that guy did twenty dates with us, and then uh, and then uh, they fired him and and brought on uh, Dan uh, Larry the Cable Guy. Why they fire that guy? You know, he was on some kind of medication that made him just get all up in Jay's, Jeff's face and just chabber nonstop, and uh-huh. Jeff just didn't like it. And, yeah. And, you know, I'm trying to pee, dude. And yeah. Be right. like, oh, and then what are we going to do next? Yeah, next yeah, 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 yeah. We should be making more money. Yeah. So, uh, anyway. So, so they yeah. brought Dan. So you were in, in the beginning. I was, uh, yeah, I was the original three. Or, yeah. Or one of the original four. And, and Larry or Dan Whitney came in later. Right. And then that became huge. Huge. It was, it couldn't have been a, you know, I, I don't know. I know, and I know Dan has got, Larry's got some flack, uh, from uh, other comedians. And, about uh, what? Uh, uh, about, well, because he, <laughs> because he made an ass load of money and, and, uh, but because if he wouldn't have been successful, nobody would have cared what he was doing. I kind of remember and, him when he was just Dan Whitney. Yeah. Kind of like at the comedy store in the late eighties. Right. And he right. just had that, you know, kind of long permy hair, right. and he was just a comic. Right. And he was, you know, he was a he was a nice guy, but he yeah. got some flack for I, I I don't know if it was hack flack or that they didn't like the character. I mean, I I never felt it really. Uh, you know, he's got he's got pretty good jokes, and you know, he and the whole thing works. I I, I yeah. never had that, but I I guess there was some backlash for well, some reason. Yeah, but he, you know, overall, you know, he's a he's a great pace, rhythm, and timing comedian. Yeah, I mean, I couldn't figure out a way to make all that stuff work. So he, you know, he sells it, he mugs it, and and. Uh, uh, but Hicks did the same thing. Hicks did Pratt Falls mug, you know. Sure, no, we all use the tools, that, right? Yeah, yeah. He did have some moves, uh, yeah, yeah, some movements, right? A, pa- a cadence, uh, yeah, right. <laughs> yeah. So uh, you know, so I, I, you know, I admire what uh, what uh, uh, Dan does, and and 
is it exactly my cup of tea? No, but I'm not either. Right. Uh, so you know, you're not exactly your cup of tea. Not exactly. No, I'm not. <laughs> Who is your cup of tea? Uh, the, the you know the funniest thing I've ever seen is a is a play called the Doyle and Debbie Show. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, which is a three person play out of Nashville. Uh, basically it's a two person play. There is a third, but a very small role. And, uh, and, uh, my wife writes with John Oates. And, uh, so we were there visiting John. They were writing together. They live in Nashville. John Oates, time. Hall and Oates? Yeah. Uh huh. And, uh, so he was just asking us, I don't know what you guys do at night, but if you want, if, if you like shows, we can go see this, uh, this, this play. And we're like, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I laughed so hard. I didn't think I could laugh that hard again. Wow. I really didn't. Because we're all so cynical. Right, exactly. And yeah. the, the, this guy, the, the guy, it's a guy and a girl, and the guy wrote it all. And uh, and uh, he just caught me from an angle I didn't see coming at all and just beat me to death. I mean, I I, I thought I was going to fall out of my chair. I was laughing so Feels hard. Feels good, right? Oh, it felt amazing. Yeah. Uh, it, it really did. And, I, and, and now I've seen it... T- Two other times, and uh, and then my wife and I got married, and we we opened the 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 ceremony with an hour and forty minute play. We brought the Doyle and Debbie show into the into the wedding in front of three hundred fifty people, and uh, because I always want people to see it, but you have to go to Nashville to see it, so that nobody ever does. Uh-huh. And I thought, well, fuck it, you know, <laughs> and, you can bring uh, it to the wedding. We're, we're bringing it to the wedding, <laughs> and uh, it was quite a production. Uh, but uh, and and the, our friends from Europe were going. So the fuck is this? It just makes no sense at all. And but it's really uh, insider, and you think it's going to be a a parody, and and they're both such good singers that you're you know I was okay with that. I'm like all right, I'm yeah. Gonna, and but it, it's not. It's a dark, twisted tale. Yeah. And uh, just b- brilliantly put together. And uh, I don't know what he'll ever do with it. Uh-huh. Uh huh. I was trying to get him to go to because uh, he he's a, he plays Zanies yeah. on Tuesday night. That's where that play is. It uh-huh. used to be a place called the Station Inn, which was a hundred year old bar downtown. And um, but he should be in Vegas with it. You know. Yeah. So do you ever too. drop into Zanies? Uh, yeah, yeah. Did I, I, uh, yeah, I did a set. We when we we did uh, salute to the troops. We went in there and ran it. Uh, oh, you did. The, yeah, that's a good area. club, man. Yeah, yeah, it is. I've been playing it for years. I used to play it two or three times a year. You oh, you played all those clubs. Oh, every one of them, man. You, you, forever was it for sixteen most, years, seventeen years of what, of straight up. You know, was if, it mostly the uh, the Southern Circuit, or, or you, you did all of it right? I mean, because I. Well, the the where, wherever the reach of the funny bone chain was, right? I, I, well, that goes all the way up to Ohio too, right? Yeah, I'd Pittsburgh, and, yeah. and uh, so, but I never did uh, Yoder gigs, which I think are one nighters up right, there. Sure, and yeah, I never did yeah. any of those. Yeah, and, yeah. And uh, and then the punchline at one time had six clubs, and so I worked those in the uh, twice in the, a year, twice a year, and then yeah. uh, Funny Bone had twenty one clubs. So, so you were set. Yeah, until they figured out that I had nowhere else to work, and they cut my money by a third and, and took away my airfare, for, which is when I quit comedy and moved to Mexico. You so, said, fuck all, them. Fuck you. Eat a steaming bowl of fuck. And you've been at it how long by that point? Oh, I don't know. About 15 or 16 years, I and guess. They, and that was, so that was when the boom crashed. They said, these guys will do it for anything. Right, right. And, and you uh, said, fuck you, and you moved to Mexico. Moved to Mexico. All right, <laughs> uh, and I still work. I still open for for Jeff. Right. And uh, so I would. Uh, How the hell do you move to Mexico? Just move down there, man. And that's it. <laughs> move down. You don't there. need papers or yeah, nothing. Well, right. You, now you need a, a vest, but right. Uh, but you, you know you you can live uh, you can live there if you want to. And uh, and your uh, big uh, idea was what? Uh, <laughs> pottery. Yeah. It was me making a fortune at the border. But what happened was, it turns out my product was uh, heavy and fragile. Which is a horrible combination. When you got to uh, put it on a truck. Yeah. So, uh. So you bought a, fa- you bought a factory from somebody or you No, I, I, it wasn't even, what it was was, it was really a big, huge art studio where I would, uh, my girlfriend at the time would teach, we basically, we did this stuff right, right. here. Uh, and uh, two, yeah, two, two existing pieces of pottery. So okay. I, we didn't make the pottery. Oh, so you got, we just did this application got, type of thing. Oh, you got terracotta and, pots. Yeah, right. And then, and then you put glued tile, shit on it. Right. Glued shit on it. But it was beautiful. I mean, uh, and, it, uh, and now whose idea was that, Ron? Was that her idea? No, it wasn't. It was, and she would, she would make this stuff and it takes forever to make. And then she would go to an art show and she'd sell it in three hours. 
And uh, But then it would take her six months to make another pile of it to go sell. So I just thought, well, why didn't somebody go to Mexico and train a room, <laughs> room full of people how to do this? And, it, you know, it was a... I won't trade the experience for anything, you know, and, and I still love Mexico and my wife is Mexican. And, uh, and, uh, and I think that's, you know, and, and you know, and, and Lori, my ex-wife and, uh, Mar- Marshall's, uh, mother was, uh, I'm like, he's five and I'm yeah. like, we're going to Mexico yeah. and uh, you're going to need to just put him on a plane and I'll be at the other end. And <laughs> you know, she's like, what? Kid, kid had a hell of experience growing up and <laughs> right. traveling in. Uh, but you know, he, it, did you it, make some money doing it? No, no, no. <laughs> How no. long were you there for? I was there for three years, I guess. And, uh, when I left, uh, the girl went crazy and, uh, who that one, the, the one artist I was with, yeah, she was crazy. Well, she was crazy. She didn't go crazy. She was already crazy. I just had these blinders on cause she was so hot that I just didn't want to see it. I know and, that one. You know, her? <laughs> right. I, know I mean, yeah. I don't know that right. girl, but right. I know that story. That, yeah. Right. <laughs> it's, it, it, it's a common story. It of, sure is a common story. And, uh, so, so she went off the rails or what? She went off the rails on a crazy train. And, yeah. uh, and, and so I was trying to get her parents to come get her. Because uh, I, because now, now I feel stuck, right? I got a, a girl in a foreign country, and she's what, she, what kind of crazy? Crazy. I uh, get trash drunk on red wine and cry. Okay, that and, kind. Uh, yeah, right. Really charming uh, stuff, and, but locked into that. Locked there, into there was it. There's no other frequency. No, no, not at that point. And <laughs> so I remember when I went into Mexico. I went in there with a uh, my I had a big custom van that I was touring in. Yeah, and, uh, and then uh, I had the biggest truck that Ryder rents. And the biggest trailer that Ryder rents uh, behind the truck. Yeah. And uh, I left three years later, and the exact same equipment just pointed the different direction, going, "Well, that didn't work out worth a shit." <laughs> and, uh, so, uh, but I, but they do fine with it. I mean, it still operates today. They they, they just business? sell it at the yeah. They just sell it there. And, Did you uh, sell the business, or you just? No, I just gave it to them. I, oh, it was a bunch of tools. And uh, a bunch of inventory, you uh-huh. know. And so I'm like, if you guys want to stay here and keep making this stuff, and then just go ahead and do it. And, and they do uh, it. They, yeah, they still do, do it. Do you hear from them? Uh, yeah, not in a while, but uh, but I had some dialogue with Irma Munoz was the lady that ran it for uh-huh. me, and uh, she was like salt of the earth, and uh, you know, not good salt, like a, like a dirty margarita salt, kind yeah, of a, yeah, kind yeah. Of thing, but salt, yeah. you know. Uh-huh. So sure. she was uh, <laughs> she was great, and you know, all the ladies that lived in this little colonia, you know, came down there and what you know, part had of Mexico? Jobs. Reynosa, across from McAllen, Texas. Is that a beach? No. It's just Mexico. No, it's just a dusty little old dried up Mexican town. There's an interesting relationship between Texas and Mexico. Oh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, that's uh that's I lost my virginity in Mexico at a oh, whorehouse really? in Tijuana when I you was did? eighteen, yeah. yeah. At, at eighteen. Yeah. So you waited a while. I'd been telling people I was getting it for a long time, but I really wasn't. And uh, let's walk through so that. I, so you just go over the border and you said, Where do I get laid? Pretty good story. I, I went over there, I I'm like, This is it. I yeah. got hundred and forty one bucks. And uh, we did my weekly or bi-weekly paycheck. And, from uh, the I'm, refinery? For, no, from the Navy. I'm oh, okay. The Navy, and they am going to A school. And uh, so I go over there, and I'm like, I'm, I'm doing it. I'm going to do it. So we get, I get in this cab, and I go, hey, you know, I want to find a woman. I, I'm gonna, and he goes, you know, you want a good woman, an ugly woman? Uh, really? I'm like, no, a good one, really good. And so he goes, it'll, it'll, it'll take a little while. So we drive and drive and drive <laughs> yeah. all over this. I mean, forever. I'm like, yeah. what the fuck is going on here? So eventually we pull up to this little uh, building with a square in the middle of it, yeah. rooms on the side. And yeah. I was in this room sitting on a uh, mattress that was sitting on the floor, and there was a little bucket of water in a corner. And uh, and uh, and a kind of cute girl came in, and, and she was talking to me. And then this ugly girl came in whose teeth were had no general direction or color. It uh-huh. was just a snaggle. Uh-huh. And, uh, and they started having an argument, and I was like, really intimidated. I was 18 years old. I was like, I hope the pretty girl wins, but she didn't win. The other girl did. And, uh, or woman. And, uh, and you didn't so, have the wherewithal to stay. No, I no, 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 no. Yeah. But I would now. I sure would now. <laughs> not, not you, 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 <laughs> there you go. So anyway, it, uh, it was really, uh, I, I, I walked out of there pretty, you know, just horrible. I felt horrible about myself. This, you know, it was, uh, I just lost it to a ugly girl that I just paid, I think, ten dollars or twenty dollars. Wow. So that was a real good one. You really did. That drive was worth it. I yeah, guess. Yeah, absolutely. So uh-huh. we so we we go back to the gate, and I notice it doesn't take near as long 
to get back to the gate as it did to get there. But I did still didn't say anything about it. And then I get there, and he, and he goes, uh, okay, that'll be $50. Well, well the pussy was 10 what, what, 50 Where do you come up with that number? 50 So I reach into my pocket, and my wallet's gone. Uh-huh. And I'm like, dude, they stole my wallet. This place is three blocks from the gate. He said, Bring! whenever it came down to money. And so they, uh, I, 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 and now I'm in there yelling yeah, and yeah. give me back my wallet. And, I, and, and, and there are probably guys in the background with machetes going, keep yelling, honky tonk. And, yeah. uh, we'll see if we can stop it. And <laughs> yeah. So uh, eventually they came out with a wallet, but it wasn't mine, but it did have a military ID in it. And, uh, but it wasn't mine. Uh-huh. And, uh, so I just went back. So now I've lost my virginity. I don't have a dime. <laughs> Uh, I actually had a dollar yeah. in, uh, in my pocket and, and, but a bus from San Diego to, 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 uh, was a quarter. Yeah. Uh, 25 cents. That's right. it. And so I took that back and I just flashed somebody else's ID when I was walking through the gate and I was like, that was, that sucked. That was, that was it. That was it. That you was left it. with, uh, with, no, with money no money and someone and, else's uh, identity. And, uh, right. It's and like someone be- else's identity. Yeah. It's like the beginning of Mad Men, the series. <laughs> right. <laughs> you could have started a whole new life as that guy. I could have. I could have. <laughs> So all right, so you come back from Mexico just to to get up up to date, and you do the tour with the uh, the guys. Basically, they said because you could it was, it was hard to get a hold of in yeah. Mexico. You're kind of uh, hard to get hold of now, actually. Right, yeah. but it was harder then. Yeah, and, uh, because you, there was no cell phone service right over the border. They right. block it. And, right. Uh, I don't even know if I had a cell phone anyway, and and the, and the phone lines almost never worked. So. They said if I wanted to be part of the Blue Collar Tour, I had to move back to the U.S. and uh, that that the, they couldn't uh, have me that far removed, and and, uh, and and everything was falling apart anyway. I mean, the relationship was yeah. uh, was really trying, and uh, so I said okay, and I, I moved back, and uh, and they were all, you know, worried ab- about me anyway because it was a pretty rowdy town, and it, but it was really only rowdy if you were there to stop the drug trades. Right. If you were just waving them by, they didn't really care about you at all. But if you, and we had a sheriff that was, uh, uh, that we, we got a new sheriff in town, so uh, he was in the newspaper saying he was going to clean up Reynosa, and I was like, ooh, I wouldn't have said that. Yeah. I, would, I just How kept that to left? myself. Yeah. Literally, he's in my favorite restaurant having dinner with the DA and two other guys. The two other guys stand up and shoot him to death. The three of them walk out the front door and nobody's ever convicted. You you were there? I, no, I wasn't there, but it was my favorite restaurant, so it was it was actually closed for a day or two and uh that, that So was, they killed was, the sheriff. Yeah, well front page of the paper. Yeah, murdered the sheriff. So who who's next? Yeah. <laughs> a guy that says <laughs> hey, anybody I'm else to... wanting to clean up the town? <laughs> <laughs> I'm willing to work with local businessmen of any kind. <laughs> of any kind, right. <laughs> We practice non-judgment. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's like, you know, whoever wins, wins. All right, so so you go back and you do the tour, and that was the life changer. Then everything turned around. Yeah. The, uh, How many the, years did you do it? Uh, with the blue collar? Yeah. Two or three and a half, I think. I'm not real good with these yeah. kind of numbers, but we, you know, we, we weren't full time on either, so we would go on and off of it. But and, like uh, right out of the gate, you guys were playing arenas? 8,000. Yeah. Uh, up to 20,000 people. And these are mostly, and they were worried about you. Was this where you had the conversation with the new manager? Like they, well, yeah, that's he was my manager at the time, and and uh, actually where he and I got into it was he's a prick. He's a genuine prick, and still your manager? Uh, no, oh no, <laughs> good God, no. He's still theirs though. Yeah, and uh, we were shooting a salute to the or whatever the what it was, blue collar two, the second one, and we were already done with it. We shot it in Denver and. We're all sitting in an after party. It's yeah. all wrapped up, and uh, there's all everybody there: the cast, the crew, the whole hee haw gang. Yeah. We're drinking. Yeah, I'm trashed, and so he had this really just loved to needle me, uh, and uh, and then he was over there drunk, and he goes, "You're nothing but an overpaid opening act. You hadn't earned a dime of your money," and I was like. Yeah. Oh, motherfucker! And uh, and it got real ugly real fast, and uh, and. And I, quite frankly, don't have the energy to hate him as much as he hates me, because uh, I, I just lose focus. Why do he hate uh, you? Uh, because he just couldn't believe that I would, uh, uh, you know, I, I actually owe the guy everything, because he's the one that got it sold to Warner Brothers, and without that, who knows what would have happened. Just a big old crapshoot. But he's just such a prick. He told the president of uh, ABC, he, hoped, he said, I hope your children die of ass cancer. And that's just him. Yeah. Just uh, did you beat him up? 
I didn't beat him up. We uh, we we just got in each other's face and yelled a lot, and and, and then he got in a car and left. And uh, and so uh, the next day he dropped me from the management company, but I wasn't really his. I was really his partner's. I uh, got him John McDonald, and uh, he dropped you after you made all that cash, and you, you made that. I mean, you, I mean, you were essential to that tour. I mean, you were. It, it was almost like you were the id of 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 the tour. You, you know, you were the guy that was talking a certain amount of truth uh, about a certain you know a way of life that everyone identified with. These other guys were were doing that as well, but you were the dark part. You were essential to it. Yeah, they they never considered kicking me off the tour. He dropped me as a client. Uh, which was kind of silly because I was generating so much money, right. and uh, and uh, which was also why I was no longer willing to take shit from him. So uh, th- that's uh, that's kind of the way it broke up. And I mean, whenever we uh, we did like three and a half years together, we still hold uh, attendance records in uh, at the oh, where the Predators play hockey in uh, Nashville, twenty three thousand people, uh, and other people have sold it out, but not with that small a stage. And uh-huh. we had it in the middle, which uh-huh. just you know, which was ridiculous, uh-huh. ridiculously big. It was too big. And, and in, in a general sense, your fans are good people. Yeah, yeah, I like them. I yeah. like them. I, I, you know, when I first started doing the meet and greet thing, I, I was not. I didn't go into that uh, really excited about doing it. And uh, but it turns out it's you know it's pretty interesting to find out what they what they wonder about yeah. me. And what is the general thing? Are you okay, Ron? Right. <laughs> pull out of it. Just pull out of it. <laughs> I can't. I've tried. Yeah. Uh but yeah, they're 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 nice people and they they you know, all they they just want to love on me. That's yeah. all. They that's they just want to love on me. And you so, can handle it. Yeah, yeah. If I I can let them love on me for yeah. a little while and yeah. uh, and then you get to you know, the wild drunk chicks that yeah. are you know, yeah. your wife's standing there and they're, <laughs> they're still they're, going, Come on, go, let's go. <laughs> Well, that's great, man. So that whole tour established you as a solo act, and now you just do your own thing. And what it, what are you pulling now, people wise, consistently? Well, I was in uh, Houston, and uh, and uh, I think my average crowd's around twenty three hundred. Yeah, I think is about what it is. Uh-huh. And, uh, but this weekend we did uh, Houston and Austin to twelve thousand people, so we did three thousand seaters uh-huh. sold out four shows. That's great, man. Two in Houston, two in Austin. And but at you, one time I sold out five of those shows in in uh, in Houston. So it, by yourself, by myself, yeah. And what what, what do you think the drop off is? You change it up, don't you? I change it up all the time, but it, it's just the I'm not the new big thing, right? And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm uh, so my fan base is huge, and there's plenty of them, and I you know it still goes just really well. But you know, it's not oh six and oh seven or uh, and oh five. I think we're bigger, but it's still it's good, it's still great. And do you do Vegas? Nine weekends a year, the Mirage. That's good, right? So I'm actually going. Yeah, it is. I'm going there this weekend and doing my regular show, and then on uh, Wednesday we're doing the uh, the big CMT show to the troops with uh, Gabriel Iglesias is going to be there. Uh, Kathleen Madigan's doing it. Uh, Josh Blue, uh, Roy Wood Jr., and uh, Geechee Guy. Do you know Geechee? Yeah, I know the name. I don't think I've ever met that guy, but I've been hearing his name for uh, as long as I remember. Right, right. He's been around for as long as you can remember. Uh, Straight up jokes. Yeah, very old school. I mean. Old old school yeah. stuff. And you that still, is, that is delightful. Yeah, oh, that's not. Well, yeah, you got to mix it up. Do you still generate all your own shit, or? I would say I'm my head writer. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I guess. So, you. Uh, but you, you, you know, you can't. Uh, I just I had sixteen uh, sixteen years to write the first record. Right. And uh, you don't have sixteen years to write the second one. So, I so there there are, you know there's two of my friends that. Uh, I think that, I know. Him. Wait, wait, Todd Sawyer. Todd did it for a little while. And it, does Hawkins do it or? Yeah, Robert Hawkins. Oh, he's uh, great. He, he opens for me, so we we work out the beats. Yeah, yeah. On the bus, yeah, going yeah. from city to city, and uh, just polish and, it up. So, yeah, just uh, he's a great and, comic. Yeah, a, a great comedian, and uh, so uh, so then Alex is usually on the bus also, and my son's very very funny, uh-huh. and, uh, and you and, guys uh, just kind of hammer it out. Just yeah, just uh, that's just, fucking great. It's yeah, like a right. traveling writer's room. Yeah, kind of. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I used to throw these uh, what I called writers' retreats, but it, uh, that uh, I, I, that I would rent this place in Austin on a lake, and we would all go there and for a weekend, and we'd bring in a chef and musicians. Yeah. And, oh yeah, uh, and uh, just and to, to brainstorm, eat a bunch of mushrooms, and uh, we'd <laughs> yeah. usually walk away with some really good stuff. And then <laughs> there was a bar called Pooties that was owned by uh, Willie Nelson's. Uh, uh, bus driver who died, uh-huh. and uh, 
but it was just all Texas honky tonk. And, uh-huh. uh, so we would take that over at night, and I would run through all the stuff we worked on, and huh. uh, and so. But with, we've always that that group of people's always written together. We used to we're the uh, Texas Hill Country Comedy Writers Association. Uh-huh. So it was a, a, a bunch of guys that have been around for a long time. And we what we do we'd, back in the day, we would just table anything uh-huh. and, and help each other put it together and then decide who do uh, it. Uh, no, you no, know, it would be your idea that you brought to the table, and, okay, and, and that's yours. Oh, I so, get it. Uh, but everybody would look at it, and you know, and that, that's a great way to create. And you, you generated know? a lot of stuff like that. Tons of stuff. That's yeah, amazing. Tons. That's a that's a that's a great way to do it. Yeah, but I, you know, I, I think most things creative are at least somewhat collaborative. And sure. So it'd be really easy for me to just go. No, I write every word of it. Right. Next question. Yeah. No, no, I I, I appreciate you being uh, honest about it. I, I, now I wish somebody could just write it and work out the beats on it <laughs> and hand it to me. And, and, uh, but that doesn't happen at all. It, it doesn't yeah. work that way. So now, in terms of uh, to finish up, like in terms of like uh, you know the reputation and and also how you. You move through your your shows. I mean, have there been times where you, you didn't judge the amount of scotch correctly? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. The last time uh, I was at the Funny Bone, I, I was at the Funny Bone in uh, Columbus, and yeah. uh, it was one of my last comedy club gigs. And I had been banned from there for ten years for getting caught making out with the manager's girlfriend in the women's bathroom. Okay, uh, that night subtle, I drank too subtle. much. Yeah, yeah. right. right. Yeah. And, uh, made some and good he, choices about location. I though. didn't think he was there, uh-huh. or I wouldn't have done it. Yeah, <laughs> so, and he'd been there all night. That's yeah. the funny thing, right? <laughs> right. <laughs> So anyway, they banned me for a long time, and I, I was really good friends with that staff. And I, I fucked up. It was my fault. It was yeah. inappropriate as it could possibly be. Sure. And uh, I, and I still blame it on her, but still, it, yeah. you know. That, well, you know. So you I come back. Give and, yourself a break, Ron. Yeah. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I come back, and uh, and they they fire hire me back to clubs yeah. new, and yeah, and uh, that one uh, in the mall. Yeah, 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 yeah. And uh, so. Uh, on set, they had most of the staff that was there when I was there before was at a wedding, so they all came in on Saturday to say hi to me. Yeah, and because uh, I was, I used to party with those kids like crazy. And, yeah, and uh, so uh, I get there's a three show night, and I get there, and the bartender is one of the guys that I really hung out with a lot. He gives me a big old glass of scotch, and I'm a jacking with everybody. And I cut to the third show. The third show, I'm I'm like, ooh. <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna go check and see where he's at. So I go in there to look to see where the middle act's at, and I can't get the two images of him within ten feet of each other. <laughs> straining, I'm like, ah, that's bad. That is horrible. And uh, I went up there and I was repeating jokes. Oh. It was just the ugliest, shittiest thing. And I'm like, well, there goes the next ten years. <laughs> so it turns out the guy was doing uh, doing the money in the back. Never saw it. So I'm like, that was great. Oh, that's that good, man. Great, so great. that was the third show, though, right? That was the third show. Oh, fuck and, it, on a Friday uh, or. Saturday. No, yeah. well, it's going to happen. Yeah, you're there for eight hours. Yeah, and you don't know what you you've just done. Drink what you drink whiskey, haven't done. Yeah. right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It all blurs together. Yeah, but usually you got you can gauge it pretty well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Normally, you know, now it's uh, uh, I just drink. I have a tequila. My brother-in-law and I have a tequila, and uh, and, and you just so, do it on one shot. I just uh, no, I take it on stage with me, and I just sip on it. No, oh, okay. Uh, so, but it, but it's uh, it, it's the tequila is outstanding. So uh, smooth. Uh, it's it's actually some of the best tequila in the world. I, uh-huh. I think. What and, kind? Uh, uh, Mine's will the, sell it. The brand is uh, Number One uh-huh. and uh, J U A N, and uh, it's uh, we make a, a silver, a reposado, and an extra añejo. And the, you make uh, it. It's ours. It's our right. Well, the distillery is in Mexico. So you're a tequila guy now. I mean, you, this is this is your brand. This is my brand. I own it with my brother-in-law. I don't even know what tequila is made of. It's made out of uh, agave uh, cactus. So the, they got a cactus farm down there, an agave farm. It's uh well, Jalisco, Mexico. Th- th- this is all tequila is made there. It's like champagne. If it's okay. not made in the champagne region, you can't call it okay. champagne. Okay. Okay. So there's a huge t- t- volcano. Tequila is yeah. the name of it. Yeah. And, uh, and, and it's gigantic. And all the land around it, uh, uh, I mean, hundreds of square miles is just covered up with blue agave. And, uh, just by huge, nature of the soil yeah, because right. of the rock, the yeah, volcanic was, ash. It's and... always been there. And, uh, huh, I didn't and, know that. Yeah. So, uh, now there's actually a tequila Mexico in my, Distilleries in the next town. So, did you uh, did you find like a master distiller? Did you, you had to interview? Yeah, guys the or? way we did it, the, the way we well, Alex had been working on it for four years and and uh, trying to find something, and so we found this guy 
that was a master distiller, a real artisan, and uh, he was making a high-end tequila that they just sold at the resorts in uh, in Mexico City, uh-huh. and uh, under a different name. And uh, but that's all he did. And so it, it was very expensive, 150 bucks a bottle in the in the resorts, or 200 dollars a bottle. Uh-huh. And so that company that he did that for uh, dropped him and opened their own distillery. And so he had that distillery, but no place to put this beautiful tequila. So we we came in and and, and negotiated with him to let us bring it to the United States, and uh, which took a while, you know, because that's their livelihood too, and they yeah. don't know a couple of even though you know Alex is uh, from Mexico and he speaks fluent Spanish, so. Yeah. Uh, but it took him a while to trust us enough with it. And, uh, and then I basically it was all his project. And I said to myself, uh, if he gets it on the shelf and, you know, then, then maybe I'll wait in. And so he did and I waited in. And, wow. Uh, so it's fun. I See, mean, it's a blast. We were down there. Our, our distillery so little and dusty and, and, uh, all these big gigantic things are around us, but they don't make better tequila. Uh huh. It's, uh, That's it, fucking it, awesome. It's a great yeah, story. Yeah, there You're you in go. the booze business. I mean, it makes total sense. Right. I, we were, in fact, we were at uh, Specs Liquor in Austin and Specs Liquor in Houston this weekend signing bottles. And uh, so other comics have book signings. I have booze signings. And, it's, uh, it, it's completely fitting, Ron. Yeah, right. Why not? Well, congratulations, man. It was great talking to you. Hey, thank you very much. for. Uh, it's great we finally got together. I, I'm thrilled, man. I love you, man. I love you, too. That's good. Aw. That's cute. <laughs> That's it. That's our show. Uh, again, uh, thank you for listening to my show. If you need anything WTF related, go to WTFPod.com. We're going to be getting the ceramic mugs back up. You can get them through the actual potter soon. T-shirts are there. Things are there. Chat board is there. Whatever you need. Whatever you need. JustCoffee.coop. You can get that. If you get a bag of the WTF blend, I will get a little uh, 10% on the back end of that. And, uh, uh, you know, I'm going to try to, you know, stay level. I don't want you getting worried. That um, you know, I'm experiencing something good and uplifting because uh, I'm still crazy and I'm still crazy with panic and I still need to figure out what to talk about on stage and off. So uh, if you want to come to the Trippany House on uh, February 18th or March 4th or 11th, go to trippany.org and come uh, support the floundering, the exploratory process. Okay, Boomer lives.